All right, hello everybody. Um, so we are back. First of all, I just want to say thank you guys so much for all of the support on the purine and pyrimidine biosynthesis video. Um, I know that I had posted that uh, pretty well in advance and word got out that it was pretty good. I'm glad you guys thought that because I did put a lot of work into it and it's once again something that uh, my students said, you know, they wanted to have some extra work on and uh, I'm starting to like making these videos for sure. Um, also on the T3 and T4 uh, thyroxin synthesis video, um, I posted that uh, pretty late on the night before the exam and over 50 of you guys ended up watching it. So that's pretty cool. I guess the word spreads quick and everything. But, um, but yeah, so today we're gonna go into probably some of the hardest stuff of Dr. Ziley's material. And it's going to be, because, uh, you know, we've learned the glycolysis and gluconeogenesis, but we're going to talk about mostly the regulation of uh, these two processes that are going on. So as you can see, first right here, um, well, first, before I start, I do want to say that, um, you know, sometimes the videos that I upload, they're kind of long. However, um, you are always free to speed them up. I know in like the settings little tab on YouTube at the bottom right corner of the video, usually there's a way to open up an options menu and then select a speed up amount. Um, usually my videos and my pace of like speaking and stuff like that, uh, 1.25 speed or 1.5 speed, probably 1.25 to be safe. But um, you know, that's what I recommend if you want, um, you know, I speak, at like, you know, a pretty laid back, easy pace. I don't wanna like leave you guys behind on everything. But um, so yeah, if you guys want to go ahead and speed it up, that will not offend me at all. Um, there's sometimes where, you know, I'll just like forget a word and then it'll be like sitting there for 10 seconds. Like, wow, I can't remember what I'm gonna say. But you know, you know how it is. Um, happens all the time, but uh, so feel free to do that. So anyway, so we are going to talk about, once again, glycolysis and gluconeogenesis regulation. Now, I know you are looking at what's on the screen. And I do want to say that so far, this is a pretty good diagram. This is kind of mo modeled off of, I believe it's in the earlier parts of lecture 24. Um, it kind of just puts glycolysis and gluconeogenesis side by side. Now, I do want to say that, you know, if you're still in the stages of just learning about, you know, how gluconeogenesis and glycolysis compare to each other without really the regulation at all, then this is a really, this is probably the best way to study it, to see it side by side. Now, as we can see uh, over here, uh, well, on the left, we have glycolysis. On the right, we have gluconeogenesis. So glycolysis proceeds from the top down. We start with glucose and we end up making pyruvate and we extract a lot of energy from it. So the glycolysis direction is goes from up to down. And we also know that the gluconeogenesis, you've learned by now, you can probably be comfortable in saying that it is the reverse of glycolysis. Well, that statement is almost correct. I mean, there's a couple bypass steps uh, that we have to deal with uh, for gluconeogenesis because as we learned uh, in glycolysis, some of these reactions, especially um, these three that have like the big loops around them, uh, the hexokinase, the PFK1, which stands for phosphofructokinase1 uh, reaction and the pyruvate kinase reaction, they have very large uh, delta G negative values, which means that they are very favored to occur in this direction based off of these enzymes and the substrates that they're working with. So the main thing, we're just doing a quick little gluconeogenesis review. Uh, the main thing is that when you start gluconeogenesis at the bottom and you go all the way up, um, these steps in glycolysis that have the very large delta G negative, which means they're very favorable, uh, gluconeogenesis knows that, okay, there's no possible way I can reverse this reaction because it's so favored to go in the forward direction. So now, gluconeogenesis has created some bypass steps. And you can look at the structure for these molecules and how they work. Um, that should be in lecture 24 as well. However, um, we just know the first bypass step uh, to get from pyruvate to phosphoenolpyruvate, which is sometimes uh, abbreviated as PEP, 
the way you do that is, well, you have, uh, in this case, this is one bypass step going from pyruvate to phosphoenopyruvate. However, it is split into two parts. There's an intermediate along this. So you would call this bypass step 1A and bypass step 1B right here. So the first one is just using the enzyme pyruvate carboxylase, and you can see ATP being put in to the reaction, and then ADP is falling out. So you know that pyruvate uh, carboxylase, it is going to end up phosphorylating. Uh, no, it's not going to phosphorylate. Um, it's going to... Uh, see, this is tricky. Whenever you have ATP and then ADP leaving, that doesn't always mean that there's a carboxyl group uh, being transferred here. Um, this just means that it is being coupled with the favorable hydrolysis of ATP from a, for, of the phosphate group from ATP, then ADP falls off. So this phosphate at this step is not stuck onto here because it's just a uh, carboxylase. So this is actually going to add CO2 to this molecule. We saw um, adding CO2 to something in the purine and pyrimidine biosynthesis video. But anyway, so we're just going to add, uh, you know, basically a functional group onto our pyruvate, and then it's going to become oxaloacetate. Now, I don't have time to have all the structures here, but you're definitely going to need to know this one for uh, especially part of exam three. Um, yeah, you'll see this molecule right here. So I'll put a couple little yellow dots next to it so that you know to study that later. Um, oxaloacetate is going to be part of the Krebs cycle or the tricarboxylic acid cycle. There's many names for this cycle, but um, you're going to need to know it for sure there because he's going to ask you to remember all of the structures of the Krebs cycle as well. But anyway, once you make oxaloacetate, now this is where the actual uh, phosphorylation of the molecule to make uh, PEP, phosphorylenopyruvate, comes in. Um, so we're going to use the enzyme PepCK is how he says it. Uh, this is the abbreviation right there. Uh, kind of sounds like the soda with uh, letter K at the end, PepCK. Haha, uh, -ha, jokes. Um, but anyway, so uh, this is going to actually, this is very unique. Uh, PepCK is going to use GTP instead of ATP in order to um, phosphorylate the oxaloacetate to become phosphoenolpyruvate. Um, so yeah, uh, that's these two steps are the first bypass step of gluconeogenesis. And then uh, I see all these ones going up right here because, um, and I didn't like write all of the, you know, what you need to put in to these molecules, like, you know, the structure. I mean, you guys know the structure. You, you got tested on glycolysis. If you don't know it, now's a good time to know it because you have to know glycolysis just as well for exam three. Uh, I know it sucks, but most of the time they just teach all glycolysis, gluconeogenesis, and Krebs cycle in one exam. So um, they're not going to change that philosophy for exam three. You still have to know this all the way. But in the sake of this video and this sheet of paper, uh, which you'll see what happens to this sheet of paper coming up soon. But um, so yeah, I didn't write all the, the other things you need to add in here and all the structures and all the enzyme names, but because um, that's not the main focus of this lecture because we're going in the gluconeogenesis direction. We just know that all of these steps, even up in here, they are all reversible. Um, you know, most of them have very small delta G values, whether they're positive or negative, they're fairly small. Um, I know one of them somewhere in here has a kind of large delta G negative, but for some reason it is reversible. And these three on the outside are the only ones that are not uh, in terms of gluconeogenesis taking care of things. But anyway, so I'm not gonna write in everything there. Uh, you can, if you want, that'd be a great study tool to do it. However, uh, you'll see what happens with this paper later. Um, just a quick thing, talking about this specific stack, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate going to glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate in the glycolysis direction, and glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate going to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate in the gluconeogenesis direction. Um, this kind of just looks a little bit weird because if you remember, uh, so it's kind of easiest to talk about in the glycolysis direction, but they're reversible. But when you have fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, you cleave that in half, basically, and you're going to yield two products. You're going to yield one molecule of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, and then you're going to yield another molecule of uh, dihydroxyacetone phosphate. Uh, 
the way I explained it to my students is that, you know, going in the glycolysis direction, uh, dihydroxyacetone phosphate is not an optimal product. Glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate is what's going to carry on uh, for the rest of this uh, reaction going in the glycolysis direction. However, once you have dihydroxyacetone phosphate, you do another step in the glycolysis that you had to learn. Excuse me. You had to do another step that you had to learn to convert dihydroxyacetone phosphate into another molecule of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So technically, once you make your second molecule of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, all of these steps below are doubled. And that's the same thing for gluconeogenesis too. Um, all these steps going in the gluconeogenesis direction, they're doubled all the way until you mash them back together into fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. But speaking of fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, um, the second bypass step for gluconeogenesis is going to involve an enzyme called fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase. Um, there is a dash one right there. Um, it's abbreviated as FBPase one. So FBPase one, fructose bis, fructose one six bisphosphatase one. Uh, we'll see what happens there, and then the last step is going from, uh, or the last bypass step because going fructose six phosphate to glucose six phosphate that is reversible. Nothing too crazy going on there. That's just an isomerization. And um, the last step, glucose 6-phosphate to glucose. Notice we're, in all these bypass steps, we are, uh, well, in these two up here, we are taking a phosphate group off of something. We're using water to perform a hydrolysis to get the inorganic phosphate kicked off of both of these molecules. So fructose 1,6-bisphosphate to fructose 6-phosphate. So bis means two phosphates on here, and then we kick one of them off, so we just have one of the phosphates, and now glucose 6-phosphate going to just glucose, we take off that last one. So it's no surprise that, you know, dealing with ATP, taking it off of a molecule, because it was so awesome to put a phosphate group using ATP and hexokinase to put a phosphate group on glucose to turn it into glucose 6-phosphate, that was a really favorable reaction. And that's why we have to, uh, you know, gluconeogenesis has its own separate set of enzymes to deal with getting that phosphate off. And uh, if you're seeing H2O go into there, it's going to be a hydrolysis reaction. Uh, I don't know if I explained this in the last video, but if we just type out the word hydrolysis, um, there's two parts of this word that you can see. You can see the word hydro right here. Obviously that means water, um, you know, nothing trivial there. And then lysis. So this is a word that all of you microbiology majors probably are very familiar with out there, or just this suffix, basically. Um, in the suffix, we see lice, and uh, basically this means to burst. Uh, when a cell, like in your body, when a cell lyses, it means that it bursts open. This happens for many different reasons. For example, if you have a virus that just, you know, infects one of your cells, it can come in and, uh, you know, reproduce itself, uh, to crazy amounts, and then the cell just like completely blows up. The cell will lice. Lice means blowing up, and it's no secret why they call that cycle of uh, virus replication the lytic cycle, the lytic. You hear the L-Y in there. Uh, the lytic cycle, um, it is going to say that your cell bursts open basically because of the virus reproducing inside yourself. But you don't need to know that for this exam. Uh, that is just uh, explaining what a hydrolysis reaction is. So if you, if you see hydrolysis or a hydrolase, lys, lace, it's the same L, basically, in the Y. Um, yeah, so that's what's going to happen here. So if that was all we had to know, just glycolysis gluconeogenesis, and it has some bypass steps, and then just use different enzymes that you have to learn, then this would be really easy. But as you guys learned, like, I believe lecture 22 was glycolysis, no, lecture 23 was glycolysis, and then lecture 24 was gluconeogenesis, and then the actual gluconeogenesis was a very little part of lecture 24, but the huge part of lecture 24 was the regulation of glycolysis and gluconeogenesis. So, um, notice there's a lot of white space on this paper. Um, that's not going to really be here anymore, but 
before we move on to this. Um, I forgot to say this at the beginning of the video. However, I want you guys to draw this out and leave some space on the side so you're gonna see what happens next. But leave some space on the side because we're going to talk about all the regulation here. And also, this is really the best way that we see all of this in here right now. This is the best way to learn glycolysis and gluconeogenesis and everything having to do with it because when you put them side by side, you can really see the picture of both directions going in the glycolysis from top to down direction. Uh, every, also, every time I talk about glycolysis, I'm gonna change it to green pointer. So glycolysis going in the up to down direction and then gluconeogenesis was always gonna be red in the down to up direction. If you see it side by side like this, then you can really start you know, having that photographic memory, you can remember a spatial orientation because, you know, knowing the names of the enzymes, that's easy to learn, but like figuring out what sides of the reactions complement each other, that's going to separate someone who gets like a B from an A or a C from a B, uh, you know, you name it from there. So, but anyway, so I warned you, uh, this is gonna get kind of complicated, but I'm gonna walk you all through it. So, you're going to scroll down, and I wrote all of this by hand, and this is what the finished product of all this is going to look like. And I actually, you know, I'm going to tell my students, I want you guys to basically copy all this down, and whether it's through this video or through reading it on your own, I want you guys to understand this because, you know, as an SI leader, I got an A in this class, and I feel like... You know, there's no way to sugarcoat this. You have to know basically, well, not basically, you have to know all of this. And um, this is literally taking all lecture 24 and putting it into one, like, you know, concentrated, not on like 17 different slides. This is putting almost everything of lecture 24 into, uh, you know, one study sheet. Because once you have all this, once again, once you have all this gluconeogenesis and glycolysis side by side, right next to each other, then you're going to start being able to draw the connection so much better. And once again, I got an A in this class. I'm gonna tell my students, uh, you know, in my group, that you basically need to do it like this because I, I can't imagine learning this any other way. Um, you know, I scored very highly on Dr. Zile's exam and it's because I bit the bullet and I'm like, wow, this is gonna suck writing all this out just like this, but I did it. And uh, I owe all of my success to doing it this way. So um, trust me if you want, I really hope you do, but um, I want you guys, everyone listening to this, and I hope you're not listening to this like the night before the exam for the first time, but I want you guys to, uh, you know, I'm releasing this video pretty early too. So, you know, as your study goes along, when it's time to study glycolysis versus gluconeogenesis and regulation, I want you guys to do all this. So we are just going to, Take a look at each individual step and see what's going on. Now, thankfully, thank God, Dr. Ziley, he focuses mainly on the glycolysis side of the regulation because the glucose, the gluconeogenesis side, they don't use the same enzymes, but the glycolysis uh, enzymes, they are much more uh, regulated by nature. And that's because you know, throughout, uh, you know, evolutionary history. Uh, it wasn't like it is nowadays where there's food absolutely everywhere. Back millions of years ago, you know, humans were hunters and gatherers. And as soon as there was food, as soon as there was an opportunity to, you know, find a mate, to reproduce or whatever situation like that, that's like critical for life, the body had to be able to regulate, you know, all the way down to the biochemistry level, it regulates all the hormones, regulate all of the, uh, the enzymes, the, the proteins, the transcription, translation, DNA, everything. It had to regulate that on the spot really fast because opportunities for food, finding a mate, reproduction, it did not happen very often. And that's how we were able to survive. And there's a lot of other things that go into that. But anyway, so we are just going to take a look at the regulation that he wants us to know. So, first of all, um, I'm going to have to do some zooming in here because there's no way we can talk about it from this level. Okay, so thankfully, um, the hexo 
kinase reaction, there is nothing really going on here that you need to know in terms of regulation. So let me get out green because I'm talking about glycolysis. Excuse me. So hexokinase, there's actually no regulation in the slides that he wants you to know about that. So awesome. But we saw all this stuff on the left side and crazily enough, this is all from PFK1, phosphofructokinase 1. But let's talk about why. First of all, phosphofructokinase 1, it is going from uh, fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. It is the committed step of glycolysis going in the up to down direction. If you think about this, we spend a lot of energy to put a phosphate group, or, you know, it's very fit, excuse me, uh, delta G is very large and negative for taking this ATP and putting it onto glucose through the hexokinase reaction to make glucose 6-phosphate. And then we, you know, there's a quick isomerization that turns it into fructose 6-phosphate, but then we take another ATP. We are investing two ATP molecules into one, or two, uh, excuse me, uh, phosphate groups into one molecule. So we are making, uh, you know, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, so there's two of them on there, but think of, you know, how, of a, how much of a high energy molecule fructose 1,6-bisphosphate is. Um, you know, that is just teeming with so much energy inside because there's two phosphates on there. So that is why the committed step, we learned that it was committed step back for uh, when we learned glycolysis for last exam, but phosphofructokinase 1 is going to be the most heavily regulated enzyme because once you double phosphorylate here, like your molecule is going through the glycolysis, there's no stopping it. It's a waterfall. It's a cascade going down. So phosphofructokinase 1, let's go over here to all the regulation stuff now that we know why it is regulated. So um, you have to start thinking in terms of regulatory molecules. Um, what does the actual regulation is the presence of other molecules that can either bind to the enzyme or induce some type of conformational change in PFK1 in this case, so that it will either be very willing and wanting to uh, convert fructose 6-phosphate into fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, or there can be inhibitory molecules that can uh, either bind to it or competitively inhibit it or not, you know, competitive or non-competitive inhibition, like all that, you have to keep that in the back of your mind because that's how it does it. But um, so let's talk about the stuff that will stop phosphofructose, phosphofructokinase 1 from acting. So these are going to be, and actually anytime I talk about glycolysis or something that encourages glycolysis, um, I tried to color code as best I can, you know, anything basically in green. These should be highlighted in green right here. I forgot to do that actually. So I'm just going to use the digital highlighter and let's see if you can still read that. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So I'm going to just highlight, I kind of bled over into the words up there, but I'm going to highlight those in green. I should have highlighted those in green. Uh, on the physical paper. So I'm sorry about that. And likewise, I should have highlighted those red. But so anytime I talk about glycolysis or something that encourages glycolysis in its enzymes, I'm going to, it's basically going to be in green. So, but, uh, and then anything, once again, I'm going to kind of make this like a pink because red would be a little bit too dark. Um, yeah, so I'll kind of put this in pink, but that really means red. Whenever I talk about that, that is something that inhibits glycolysis or you know, if something inhibits glycolysis, you can kind of draw the conclusion that it is going to help out the gluconeogenesis cause. So, but anyway, why does ATP inhibit phosphofructokinase 1 from acting? Well, if you think about what does it mean when your body has a lot of ATP? I write this question up here. It says, why break down sugar if you already have energy? So I want you to think about that. Why break down sugar if you already have energy? ATP has an inhibitory effect on phosphofructokinase 1 because when you use glycolysis, glycolysis is the process. So let me switch over to green. <laughs> glycolysis is the process when you eat food, aka when glucose enters your body from the outside. If you eat, you know, a whole bunch of candy, you're going to get a lot of sugar or glucose in you. Even, you know, like carbohydrates, you go out and eat pasta, that's a lot of glucose. 
Uh, I'm addicted to pasta, fun fact. But anyway, so once you take glucose in, um, basically ATP, talking about it being inhibitory, ATP suggests that you have already eaten food and that you have a whole ton of energy because you get your energy from food. You have a whole ton of energy and you've already broken down a whole bunch of glucose just prior. So having ATP in your body is going to suggest that. So if you have ATP in your body, um, it's going to basically say, hey, phosphofructokinase one, we already went all the way, sometimes it's lags, I apologize, but we already went all the way down to the end of glycolysis and we made our final product of pyruvate. You know, we did this so many times, thousands of cycles of glycolysis. So when ATP is present, it just tells the body, hey, can you chill out and stop, uh, you know, double phosphorylating fructose one six phosphate? Because once again, once it reaches this level, then it has to go all the way down to the end of glycolysis. So ATP is going to come along, it's going to come along and say, hey, we've had enough of all this glucose. Let's just chill out for a second. So cool. Uh, you're starting to tie ATP to a function uh, in the body and uh, a regulatory function because you know your body's not going to want to spend all the energy on glycolysis to do this. So um, that's one of the inhibitory molecules. The other one is citrate. Now this is something at the time of me posting this video. Uh, this is going to be on Sunday night. It's currently 11:57 p.m. So it's basically going to be Monday morning. But anyway, at this time, you guys have not learned about the uh, the Krebs cycle or the tricarboxylic acid cycle, however you want to remember that name, but you have not really learned about that. Citrate is a key player in the, uh, in the Krebs cycle. I have to call it Krebs cycle because that's what most of you guys know it from, from like biology. So it's a key player in the Krebs cycle and citrate um, it's, it's, it's like a definite molecule in the Krebs cycle. So that's another thing. Like, you know, when ATP is present in your cell, it's saying that, hey, I have a whole bunch of food. Like, it's fine. We already digested it. Chill out, PFK1, chill out. But citrate is also going to convey the same message. But since citrate, like if we scroll all the way down to the bottom here, once you make pyruvate, um, it quickly gets converted, you know, because py pyruvate is what enters the tricarboxylic acid cycle, the Krebs cycle. So once you make pyruvate, um, it's going to enter the Krebs cycle and quickly be converted into the next step of that cycle, which is called citrate. So it basically says that if you have a whole bunch of citrate around, that is a molecule that is present when you've already digested food. The citrate's gonna tell PFK1, hey, chill out once again. Uh, I already digested all of your glucose and now I need to uh, go through oxidative phosphorylation and you know extract all the electrons from this molecule and send them down to the electron transport chain, which you guys will learn all about as well. And then it spins ATP synthase, uh, which is in the mitochondrial membrane, which basically gives you even more ATP. So it, it, it's basically like a super downstream product because, you know, uh, there's PFK1 is very high upstream and then something like pyruvate is way far downstream, but even farther downstream uh, is going to be uh, stuff in the tricarboxylic acid cycle, the Krebs cycle. So, um, oh, I lost it there. Um, yeah, so citrate is just a super downstream product and when it's there, it just says, hey, PFK1, relax. All right, so those are the two, and I kind of just said those uh, bullet points right here, um, but those are the two inhibitory molecules of PFK1. So now where things get even more spicy, um, <laughs> it's specifically fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, but we'll go into that. But first, let's just talk about uh, the converse of having ATP is having either ADP or AMP. So I'll switch over to green because these are molecules that uh, stimulate glycolysis and PFK1 likewise. So um, I write this question right above here. Well, we have to talk about why is ADP or AMP uh, a stimulatory molecule? So these two molecules are going to show that the body needs energy and it wants to do some glucose breakdown. 
in other words, glycolysis, because once again, glycolysis is taking glucose and extracting all the energy from glucose in the glycolysis direction that you can. So ADP and ANP means that your body is in a energy starved state. So it's gonna to want to go in the glycolysis direction. So easy there is the opposite of ATP. But fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, this is going to be the hardest part of the regulation because fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, it sounds very similar to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. And that's because they um, have very, very similar, obviously structure, but they're going to be best friends basically. So fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, let's look at what it does. First of all, first bullet point in green, it encourages fructose 1,6-bisphosphate formation. Awesome. So if you're going to encourage a product down here, it's definitely going to be an upregulator of phosphofructokinase 1 enzyme right there. It also, like I just said, allosterically activates uh, PFK1. So allosterically activates, you just have to remember that's the sigmoidal shape of the uh, enzyme kinetics curve with like Vmax and stuff like that, KM. Uh, we'll touch on a little bit of that at the end. So allosterically activates PFK1. That just means, you know, it's an activator. Um, it is made when uh, fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, this is just a quick little thing saying, it's made when phosphofructokinase 2, which is different than phosphofructokinase 1, but you can probably guess that they're going to just act on the best friend molecules. Uh, phospho, fru, uh, fructose 2,6-bisphosphate is made when PF, PFK2 phosphorylates fructose 6-phosphate. So PFK2 and PFK1 are the best friend enzymes, which means fructose 2,6-bisphosphate and fructose 1,6-bisphosphate are the best friend molecules. But the enzymes, they're going to act on what comes right before that molecule, so fructose 6-phosphate. Um, when PFK2 gets its hands on fructose 6-phosphate laying around, it's going to make fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, whereas PFK1, when it gets its hand on fructose 6-phosphate, it's going to make fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. So I know I'm repeating a lot of this as well, but like... Uh, I'd rather repeat it a lot for you guys who don't know this, uh, I mean, to be honest, anywhere as much as I do at the moment, because I'm an SI leader and I've already taken this class, but, um, you know, just, I need you to start really making these connections in the head. So I'm going to repeat a lot of things, but bear with me. So, uh, last bullet point, fructose 2, or phosphofructokinase 2, uh, is the bifunctional enzyme half for glycolysis. I almost didn't see this down here, and I'm like, wait, it is not exactly the bifunctional enzyme. But anyway, phosphofructokinase 2 is the bifunctional enzyme half for glycolysis. So it's a bifunctional enzyme, but half of it is for glycolysis, and half is going to stimulate gluconeogenesis over here. But let's take a look, because this, this was the next, this is probably the hardest part of lecture 24 right here this whole bifunctional enzyme thing and how it ties into fructose 2,6-bisphosphate and uh, the glycolysis direction and its interaction with fructose 6-phosphate. So let's take a look at how the bifunctional enzyme works. So the bifunctional enzyme, uh, you can probably remember this diagram in the slide. I kind of just copied it out on my own, but it's really the only way to learn it. Um, it's going to have one component that is phosphofructokinase 2. That is the actual enzyme. So PFK1 is freestanding, but PFK2 is part, it's a subunit of the bifunctional enzyme. And it is, you know, sadly linked to FBPase 2, fructose bisphosphatase 2. So we have a kinase and a phosphatase. PASE means phosphatase. So a kinase phosphorylates things, however, a phosphatase takes it off. So the bifunctional enzyme has a reciprocal function on whatever it's going to be acting on. But let's take a look. When phosphofructokinase 2, I outlined it in green, so we're, it, this is going to be the stimulator of glycolysis, so it's a glycolysis stimulant. The whole goal of phosphofructokinase 2 is to make more fructose 2,6-bisphosphate uh, from uh, fructose 6-phosphate. Okay, so when 
phosphofructokinase 2 part of the bifunctional enzyme is active, um, you have to also know that the active PFK2 is when the bifunctional enzyme complex, uh, notice that it has this molecule sticking off down here and this one sticking off right here. When it is not phosphorylated, know this as being not phosphorylated rather than just this OH. When the bifunctional enzyme is not phosphorylated, then PFK2 half of it is going to be active, which means that glycolysis is going to be stimulated. So you have to think, uh, you know, when PFK2 is active, you need to think that it's going to make more fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. We learned that fructose 2,6-bisphosphate encourages fructose 1,6-bisphosphate formation, and that's this molecule right here. So when PFK2 is active, it's going to make the best friend molecule for fructose 1,6-bisphosphate to encourage fructose 1,6-bisphosphate to form. So link PFK2 with stimulating PFK1 due to the best friend molecule clause, I guess. So um, how does phosphofructokinase 2 and, you know, how does, the, how does the bifunctional enzyme know to be not phosphorylated to stimulate glycolysis? Uh, basically, this is going to happen. This is another regulatory molecule of basically like another regulatory enzyme. So there's a lot of chain regulation you have to go on with all this. Phospho, the bifunctional enzyme knows to have the PFK, PFK2 subunit not phosphorylated, meaning the PFK2 subunit is active. It knows to do this when there is high insulin content in your body which means you have high blood glucose. So let's think, insulin. Uh, the way I teach my students to remember what insulin means is insulin in, the glucose is in, as opposed to glucagon, where the glucose is gone. So remember that if you want. But insulin, the glucose is in, you just ate food, which means you have high blood glucose. Think about it, diabetics, when they eat, when they eat a lot of sugary food, uh, you know, they start talking about insulin and, you know, their glucose, blood glucose level is high. Insulin means that the glucose is in and that you are in a well-fed state. When you are in a well-fed state, that means that there's glucose hanging around that needs to go through glycolysis. So insulin is going to, whoopsies, insulin is going to make the bifunctional enzyme not phosphorylated, make PFK2 active, which is going to make more fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, which is the best friend molecule that encourages fructose one, excuse me, one six bisphosphate to form. And once that happens, uh, you know, PFK one, it, well, when fructose one six bisphosphate is formed because phosphofructokinase one gets its hand on fructose six phosphate. So notice we're going all the way here. We're saying insulin affects this right here, which makes more fructose two th six bisphosphate. Follow my cursor, insulin, PFK two more fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. It's going to be the best friend molecule of fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, which was formed when, over here, PFK1 got its hands on fructose 6-bisphosphate. Fructose so, like, we have this big chain of regulation that's happening. It's really a lot to learn at first, but the more you sit down and look at this, the more it will make sense. So, but also, uh, so let's talk about the other half of the bifunctional enzyme real quick. Um, we have uh, up, so we're kind of at this point right now. We talked about we're not we haven't talked about the bottom case yet, but we kind of started at the left and we're coming up at the top. So if not phosphorylated means PFK two is active, well then to get FBPase two active, you could probably bet that we're going to want to take this and actually phosphorylate it. So we're going to add some ATP, and um, now I know this triangle is green, but over here is in red. So now from we're going to talk about stuff that technically helps out the gluconeogenesis side of things. So all of the green, all of the triangles have to be in green to make it, you know, I don't want to put a red triangle because we have red axes. So that would confuse you guys. But um, so we have an activation of the bifunctional enzyme being phosphorylated. Uh, that is going to be stimulated by glucagon. Remember that uh, the gluconeogenesis side of everything wants to happen when you are starving, when you're really hungry, 
you don't have a whole bunch of glucose in the blood that from your food that can just go ahead and go through glycolysis and get all the energy from. Um, gluconeogenesis exists as a process because even when you don't have like food from the outside coming into your body, you're going to have a lot of things like fat storage and glycogen storage. Like when, when you eat a whole bunch of pasta and you eat all the carbs, it gets stored as glycogen, which is a whole bunch of glucose molecules linked together, basically. So glucagon means that you are not in a well-fed state. So you have low blood glucose and you need to use your stored uh, energy molecules such as carbohydrates and uh, glycogen and fat and things like that. That's going to spur gluconeogenesis because your body still needs glucose, the actual molecule, to be able to fuel some other reactions that have been so fine-tuned to glucose that they won't accept any other fuel. It's like going to put diesel in a gas car. Uh, a normal gas car. You know, your car has been built from the ground up to run off of normal gasoline. But if you put diesel in it, uh, and I know some of my family members have diesel cars, so for them, they would have to reverse this. So if you're one of the few who has a diesel, then reverse this. But like, if your car takes normal gas, you cannot put diesel in it. So there are many reactions that must run on just uh, glucose, but uh, you can't use any other kind of energy molecule. So your body will use its stored energy to make glucose out of thin air, basically. And that's how you basically burn fat and uh, you know get rid of all your glycogen. So, uh, hope that makes sense. You phosphorylate the bifunctional enzyme to make... PFK2 is now no longer active down here, but FBPase2 is active. Fructose, or... Uh, that's going to be uh, fructose 1,6, oh yeah, it's right up here. I'm sorry about that, I, I blanked for a second. Uh, fructose 1,6 bisphosphatase. Now this is fructose 1,6 bisphosphatase, or fructose 2,6 down here. I'm, uh, I apologize, and it's right over here to the left, I wasn't even looking. Uh, it's fructose 2,6 bisphosphatase. Uh, so, the best friend molecule fructose 2,6 bisphosphate can be made by PFK2 uh, getting its hands on fructose 6-phosphate. But uh, FBPase2 is going to come along and it's going to basically kill off the best friend molecule. Um, it's going to uh, take one of these phosphate groups off of fructose 2,6 bisphosphate because it is a phosphatase. It takes phosphate groups off of something. That's what that suffix right there means. So when FBPase 2 is active, it's going to downregulate fructose 2,6 bisphosphate for, uh, formation. Now that is the best friend molecule, and then you can trace this chain all the way up here. Now if you don't have the best friend molecule, then uh, fructose 1,6 bisphosphate formation is not going to be encouraged because of FBPase 2 activity of the bifunctional enzyme. Therefore, PFK1 is going to be uh, inhibited, basically. Well chain inhibited. The fructose, this enzyme does not directly uh, inhibit that, but by this chain and by default, I guess we can say, you can connect it. You, you don't want to say it inhibits it, but it's going to inhibit stuff that normally helps PFK1. So think of it like that specifically, because, you know, this enzyme is not going to technically touch that enzyme, but it's going to touch the chain that makes that enzyme become super active uh, with the whole best friend thing. So the last thing I need to talk about, uh, and then, you know, one, once again, if you have, if you have FBPH2 active, then high insulin will kick it back into gear to have the dephosphorylation and uh, the PFK2 part of it active. But so the last thing I need to talk to you about is these two little things in yellow right here. So basically insulin is, We'll start on the left side. Um, so we're talking about glycolysis stuff again. Insulin is, it encourages the bifunctional enzyme to be uh, not phosphorylated so that PFK2 is active. So what is the actual enzyme that takes this phosphate group off? It's not insulin. That's just a hormone. 
that just signals to your cell what is going on in the world. What the, the actual protein enzyme that takes this phosphate group off, because um, FEPase 2, this phosphatase activity takes the phosphate off of the target molecule. But the protein that takes off this phosphate off of the bifunctional enzyme itself is actually PP1. And we have seen this before in Dr. Ziley's earlier lectures. This is protein phosphatase 1. I believe it stands for, but I, I just know it as PP1, to be honest. Um, he's usually just going to give you that abbreviation, by the way. So PP1, we've seen it before. This is the protein phosphatase 1 that takes the phosphate group off of the bifunctional enzyme itself, not over here. It doesn't take it off of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. It takes it off of the bifunctional enzyme. So PP1 activity is what's truly upregulated by insulin to make the bifunctional enzyme be not phosphorylated, as you can see right here. So, but now, likewise, or in the converse direction, we have to think what is going to put the actual phosphate group on to uh, the bifunctional enzyme. And that's going to be our old friend PKA. Now, somewhere in the slides, he had a different, uh, he had a different enzyme kind of listed here and also down here in the, uh, pervivate kinase regulation that we'll get to. But I think he had a different enzyme here, but it is he wants you to remember it as PKA instead of whatever the hell else it was. I can't remember what it was, to be honest. But he said that whatever thing is right here does the same thing as PKA, and it's, I believe, just a slightly different form of PKA. I forget his reasoning, but know it as PKA. You can trust me on that. You can go back and listen to the lectures where he tells you that. Um, I made absolute sure of it. Uh, I made sure of it when I was a student studying in this course, and I made sure of it before I taught it to you. So, uh, because, you know, this helps us learn two molecules that we've already used before, and they can do many things. Remember when we were talking about epinephrine, well, you guys weren't in my session uh, when I was talking to my students about it, but you had to learn about how epinephrine uh, signaling eventually, you know, it stimulates the GCPR. Uh, it sends G sub alpha unit uh, when GTP is bound over to adenyl cyclase, which then turns ATP into cyclic AMP, CAMP. And then CAMP is going to go ahead, you guys like calling it CAMP, I call it cyclic AMP. But so CAMP is going to go ahead and activate PKA. This is that same PKA right here. So woohoo, we learned that PKA has a whole ton of targets within the human body and the bifunctional enzyme, lo and behold, is one of them. So once again, glucagon is going to, uh, glucagon is what is actually upregulating up PKA. It's not uh, upregulating the bifunctional enzyme. It's upregulating the thing that phosphorylates the bifunctional enzyme, which determines what the bifunctional enzyme does. So with that said, all of this above this black, I, I drew this black line to separate. All this above the black line is all talking about the regulation of PFK1, phosphofructokinase 1. There is so much regulation going on here because this is the committed step. When phosphofructokinase 1 gets its hands on fructose 6-phosphate, uh, fructose um, talking about glycolysis, when PFK1 gets this, and through whatever kind of help it wants to receive over here, you know, there's inhibition as well, but there's going to be a lot of things that can help the body and, you know, help PK1 get its hands on fructose 6-phosphate and turn it into fructose 1,6-bisphosphate because that is what goes through the cascade that you can't stop, known as glycolysis. So, awesome. So, let's, while we're on the PFK1, um, let's kind of, now, thankfully, there's nowhere as much regulation in gluconeogenesis that you have to know. Um, the gluconeogenesis for fructose 1,6-bisphosphatates, uh, FBPase 1, all this regulation just basically is the other half down here that we've already talked about of the bifunctional enzyme over here. So, um, but let's just do some, uh, let's do some quick, uh, drawing of comparisons. So let's take a look at the regulatory molecules for fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase because so, that takes the second phosphate group off of the 
glucose 1, 6 bisphosphate, and it says, no, I do not want you to go down through glycolysis. So regulatory, once again, regulation is because of special molecules that affect the enzyme. So once again, you have to understand that. Re enzymes don't regulate other enzymes 99% of the time. Free, uh, like other free molecules are going to be the competitive and non-competitive inhibitors of the actual enzyme. So remember this, that is a key concept. But fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase 1, let's take a look at, there's nothing really that activates it so much that he wants you to know. Um, you, you have to know about the bifunctional enzyme and how that is can encourage the bifunctional enzyme to have FPPase 2 activity. Uh, which, you know, as we said, kills the best friend molecule for uh, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, which is fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. Um, in a way, killing that best friend molecule is going to help out the gluconeogenesis cause. However, um, you know, we, he, there's not many free molecules that activate this enzyme, but you can knock out the best friend cause that you know, helps fructose 1,6-bisphosphate form. That, you know, it shows that it's not direct uh, upregulation, but it is upregulation as a result of many other different events that happened all over here on the left side of the paper. So, uh, things that inhibit fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. So if you're inhibiting fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase, FBPase 1, you are helping out now the glycolysis side of things. So, AMP, is going to inhibit gluconeogenesis, uh, this enzyme right here. And you have to think of this because, um, I mean, you can just process of elimination. If we said that AMP uh, helped glycolysis, it's definitely gonna, not gonna help gluconeogenesis over here. Um, but when AMP is present, it says that, um, you, when AMP is present, you know, you're going to be in a lower energy state and uh, gluconeogenesis happens in a lower energy state. But at this part of the game up here in this regulation of it, um, having AMP present is basically going to, um, like AMP is present because you just, took phosphate groups and you stuck them on to fructose 6-phosphate. When AMP is present, it means that your body just did this. It just did this part of glycolysis. So AMP, it took me to remember a little bit to remember why this was over here. Um, when AMP is present, it just suggests that your body just started the glycolysis type of thing. So um, now ATP doesn't because AMP is the opposite of ATP, basically. So, but he doesn't specifically say that ATP should have a green triangle over here next to this enzyme, uh, because technically the molecule does not bind anywhere to uh, FPPase one. So, but these things definitely inhibit it. It doesn't really have many known direct in uh, upregulators, basically activators. So um, that's what you need to think here. And then uh, fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, it is, once again, it's such a strong molecule. It's the best friend molecule of uh, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. So when fructose 2,6-bisphosphate is around, it's really going to tell a gluconeogenesis not to happen because fructose 2,6-bisphosphate is such a strong activator of PFK1 that uh, it's going to override any type of gluconeogenesis on this whole entire other side of the paper that's trying to happen. So fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, once again, it's a star player. So uh, this is actually for the end in the orange right here. It was just the only other empty space I had on the paper. Um, notice the, these little eyes right here, it's looking in this direction. So you know these, these eyes are telling you to look down here. Basically, we're gonna do this at the end. So, um, but the last part of regulation we need to talk about, because remember all the things right in here, uh, they are reversible. Uh, you know, glycolysis direction, they're reversible. A gluconeogenesis direction, they are reversible. Um, there's no regulation that happens on these because these happen very easily and freely. Um, it's not to say the products are super stable, but like, you know, they can go in forward or reverse. It happens very simultaneously, but, 
the last, once again, the last uh, bypass steps, um, the, now the gluconeogenesis side is not really regulated, but the, the glycolysis side is heavily regulated on pyruvate kinase. Uh, because remember, in the up to down direction, phosphoenopyruvate was almost the final product for glycolysis, but no, pyruvate is. So basically, this is the final form of the glucose. You, you basically destroy it, you extract all the energy from it, and then, uh, you know, this step is going to be regulated because it's like the home stretch, basically. So um, there is pyruvate kinase. It has regulation in the liver, which is going to be everything over here. Once again, this is almost the same exact uh, diagram that is in the slides, but I just rewrote it, you know, in my way so I can explain it and, you know, color code some things like that. So it has a specific regulation pattern in the liver and then it has a specific regulation pattern in this the slides say uh all other glycolytic cells but just remember it's all other cells basically because almost every kind of cell in your body does glycolysis um i can't think of any off the top of my head that do not maybe there is um i don't know everything is in this eye leader but that's not really a test question you're going to ask on like what cells do not perform glycolysis so Whatever, I don't even know why I mentioned that. But anyway, in all other glycolytic cells, we're going to have this regulation over here. So let's talk about actually in the liver first. So uh, pyruvate kinase, once again, this is the enzyme. Pyruvate kinase is this little bean right here. And it's this little bean over here because it has an active and an inactive state in your liver. As we can see in purple, pyruvate kinase regulation in the liver. And this is the diagram for it. So um, we have to think about what's going to make pyruvate kinase active to form pyruvate and what's going to make it not active in order to regulate this step. You know, uh, this is still, once again, over here, the inactive form is still pyruvate kinase. It is not one of these enzymes over here. Do not make that mistake. It is, in this, I switched to red because it is inactive. It doesn't directly cause gluconeogenesis to happen gluconeogenesis to happen. But if glycolysis is not happening, then you could probably bet that gluconeogenesis is. So once again, there's a style of thinking you have to get used to. So um, let's start actually from the bottom because we're going to want to talk first about in the liver, how does how is pyruvate kinase signaled to continue doing its proper job to make pyruvate? So basically, we're saying, how do we get from the inactive to active form of pyruvate kinase? So once again, uh, glycolysis happens because you were hungry and you just ate a whole bunch of food. So right before, you know, as you're eating that food, you are energy de deficient. You have an energy deficiency, but the food is coming in, which means insulin is going to be released. It's the hormone insulin that is uh, released in your body because the food is just entering into your system. Awesome. So here's uh, a case where the phosphorylated uh, protein or enzyme right here is not active. See, this, this is a phosphate group. It is not active. So what do we know that can take a phosphate group off of something? Uh, hint, hint, it was the same one up here and you're looking right at it. You probably saw it before I even said it. But when insulin is present, it upregulates PP1, protein phosphatase 1. We've seen it before. It will cause PP1 expression to go really high, and it's going to uh, take the phos it's going to take this phosphate group off of all of the million copies of pyruvate kinase that are in all your cells. So once again, it's a phosphatase, so it makes use of water to do a hydrolase reaction. So insulin is going to cause PP1 to be active to take this phosphate group off of the inactive form of pyruvate kinase and form the active pyruvate kinase right here. So uh, it's inactive when you're energy deficient, and it is active when you have an energy surplus. You have all this glucose laying around that you need to take the energy from. Awesome. So now just to talk about the half. You can tell it's like almost all of regulation, you learn one half of it, and then the other half is the opposite which is really awesome. So I'm gonna switch over to red because this is inhibiting glycolysis. It's not necessarily saying gluconeogenesis, but it is inhibiting glycolysis. So by chain 
thinking, you can say that it kind of helps the case for, once again, for neogenesis. So uh, the active going to inactive. So to inactivate pyruvate kinase in the liver, uh, that's going to be the job of glucagon. Once again, the glucose is gone. Uh, you are starving. You can't make the final product of glycolysis if you don't have any food, basically. So um, glucagon, when you are starving, it's going to upregulate PKA, protein kinase A, and it's going to stick a phosphoryl group on what was once the active form to make it inactive. So, you know, it's a kinase. So this is the phosphate of uh, protein kinase A, and it's going to, you know, your ATP goes in, you lose AD, ADP, and then, uh, you know, your enzyme is phosphorylated and now inactive in this case. So that is what happens in the liver. So now let's talk about the regulation in all other gly glycolytic cells. So once again, we're dealing with pyruvate kinase right here. I kind of, I want it in the slides, it's like kind of in this vertical row right here, but I just didn't have enough space. And uh, this uh, paper is already chock full of information as it stands. So, um, so an activator of pyruvate kinase one in all other glycolytic cells is once again, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. This is fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Um, although its main job is to um, go through uh, the rest of glycolysis, the fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, we're saying, it, it sounds strange, we're saying that fructose 1,6-bisphosphate uh, is an activator of pyruvate kinase. Well, if you think about it, uh, you know, this fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, you know, there's going to be a lot of it sitting around because these are very favorable reactions. They're going to happen super fast so that this is going to pile up every once in a while. And when it does, it's like, oh, you know, I also have a second job I can do. You know, it, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate can, you know, become glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and go all the way down through this pathway. But while it's sitting around with nothing to do, waiting to be converted to glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, um, it can sneak over to pyruvate kinase and say, hey, uh, I'm going to activate you. You need to start doing your job because there's a hell of a lot of sugar coming your way, basically. Um, so that's how we can say phospho, or fructose 1,6-bisphosphate is an activator of pyruvate kinase because it just, while it's waiting around, it will uh, activate this right here. So now uh, we talk about the inhibitors of pyruvate kinase. So once again, this is all, all of the glycolytic cells. This is not in the liver. So first of all, we have ATP. Um, this is a common theme in the glycolysis direction. ATP is mostly going to inhibit everything because you know ATP being plentiful in your body means, hey, I already got done eating. I'm already done digesting. I have a whole ton of energy. I am sick of making more of it. So that's why ATP is a inhibitor of pyruvate kinase. Um, Acetyl-CoA, um, pyruvate, um, pyruvate becomes acetyl-CoA through what you learned in lecture 26, I believe, actually. Pyruvate becomes acetyl-CoA, and that's what actually enters the Krebs cycle. I know I said pyruvate enters it, but pyruvate gets slightly modified uh, through the TPP, lipoate, and FAD. You remember that, like, uh, big... Uh, you don't have to know all the details of the mechanism. I don't know if I'm going to do a video on that. But, um... Because he, he basically just says that you don't need to know most of that lecture, but you need to understand what's going on. Uh, so no memorizing, but you have to understand, basically. So, um... So... Pyruvate becomes acetyl-CoA, and then it enters the Krebs cycle. So once again, if you have acetyl-CoA, just like above, if we had citrate, uh, that's going to be an indicator that the all of the, you know, the the product of glycolysis has entered the TCA cycle, and it's gone even further on. You know, like, you know, the kids going off to college in the TCA cycle. Whatever you want to do to remember this, I don't know, but um. That's how we can say that acetyl-CoA is an inhibitor because it is a sign that the glycolysis has happened so much that it has now entered the Krebs cycle. So fun stuff there. 
Uh, next, long chain fatty acids can actually come over here and inhibit pyruvate kinase. Well, let's think about it. Why, in what situation would you have long chain fatty acids in excess in your cell? When you are well fed. When you're well fed, you know, your body's gonna store some of the sugar as glycogen, but it's also going to store some of the energy as fat, which all of us are desperately trying to get rid of off of our bodies. So when you have long chain fatty acids, mostly that are like fresh from being formed, um, because you know some of us we have a lot of body weight, but um, you know glycolysis still happens. Just fat staying around in general is not going to stop glycolysis. It's more so the freshly formed long chain fatty acids that are going to uh, inhibit pyruvate kinase. Because once again, ATP, acetyl CoA, long chain fatty acids. Those are all signs that you have a whole bunch of food that you already processed. So, and then this one's a little bit tougher to understand what's going on. Alanine. So alanine, uh, it's an amino acid. So what is it doing with pyruvate kinase? Well, basically um, it, it can kind of rub up against this enzyme and say, hey, uh, you need to stop doing this because alanine and pyruvate are actually almost the same exact molecule. Think back to transamination. You know, I even wrote this right here. Gave you the answer before I started talking about it. Think back to nitrogen metabolism and um, basically what the idea of a alpha keto acid is. So an alpha keto acid is, it's when you take a protein and you take off, or an amino acid, you take off the N terminus of this amino acid and you replace it with the C double bond O carbonyl. And then the, uh, the N terminus gets transferred to some other acceptor molecule. So pyruvate is the alpha keto acid form of alanine. And we remember that transamination, the, the, the K, the, the kinetic K, um, it's very close to one in that reaction. So if you guys remember what K means in, uh, you know, any like A plus B going to C plus D reaction, the K, it's a, it's a thermodynamic equilibrium number. So, but, uh, the K of, and I know I'm, I'm pretty sharp on like what all the enzyme kinetics were. I know most of you guys never want to look back at that again, but you're going to see little bits of it here and there. But uh, the K for alanine and pyruvate transaminating is very close to one. So it's very close to reversible. So when you have alanine around, that basically means you have pyruvate down. This is feedback inhibition. When you already have the results of what's, you know, you have plenty full of the results you're trying to make with this enzyme, it's going to say, hey, chill out. I already have enough pyruvate. Uh, alanine is another uh, it's the best friend of pyruvate, I guess you can say right there. When you have alanine, that means you have pyruvate. So it will tell, the alanine will tell pyruvate kinase to chill out, basically. So that is all of the regulation for glycolysis. And actually, you know, we are done with, wow, uh, it kind of snuck up on me. We are done with all of the regulation on this slide. And therefore we are almost at the very end of this video. Awesome, because I know this is a long video. We're at an hour, eight minutes and 34 seconds as we, sit, as we talk right now. So uh, the last thing we have to do is, you know, this, uh, learning all of this, mostly on this side, and then you have to know how this is basically like what's going on with the bottom half, the bifunctional enzyme. Uh, knowing, learning all of this is going to take some time and it's gonna take some effort it is not impossible because how could I sit here and explain this? I think pretty well, it makes sense to me uh, after I studied it a lot. Now, I, I'm not the genius who never studies and then gets an A exam. I had to work very hard in this class to understand everything, but it is possible. I'm like most of you out there, uh, you know what I mean? I actually, you know, my lowest score was on exam one. Now, I got an A in the class, so that wasn't super low uh, because I still got an A. However, it was my lowest score, and it made me realize, like, oh, crap, I need to start really figuring out how to study. So if I can do it, I know you guys can. So learning all this regulation on both these sides is going to be really tough. So 
But now this is like built in practice problems. Let's, I, I tell you guys to whenever you study this, just quickly take a look. Uh, every time you study this, take a look at uh, lecture 24, slide 12. And we're going to talk about the graph that's on that page. And now with all of this knowledge, we can finally explain it. So we're going to lecture 24. Um, yeah, it's this graph. So let me zoom out a little bit. Does this get it all on here? Yes, it does. This is the perfect number for zoom. Awesome. Okay, so um, now I'm just gonna, my general, I, I'll change my pointer to blue this time. Normally my general pointer is green, but I'm gonna change that. Okay, so this slide talks about the allosteric activation and inhibition of phosphofructokinase 1. What a coincidence that it was basically all of this stuff over here. The big bulk of all this, we're going to put this into a graph. So um, let's just talk about the dimensions or the axes of the graph. Don't be scared. This is an easy enzyme kinetics graph. This is not like Michaelis Menten, which was insane. Um, I know some of you guys might still have nightmares about it. but um, So let's take a look at what's on this. Uh, axis. This is V naught over V max. Um, this should, you could also just label this side as just the velocity, like just V. V naught over V max is just saying at any one point in time, what uh, velocity, which is basically the efficiency, is the enzyme performing at. Once again, the enzyme is PFK1, so do keep that in mind. So, um, you could just cross this out if you really want to, if you really want to make it a little bit easier to understand. This is just velocity axis. So, but once again, we run into some things that we might remember about. Half, you have max velocity right here, maximum velocity, and then you have half of the maximum velocity. You know, you have to remember that half maximum velocity, I'll give you a second, what is it? What, what, do, what term is this? This is going to be KD. Um, um, no, not KD. This is just going to be one half Vmax. I, excuse me. Um, well, no, because KM is a substrate concentration at which you reach half of Vmax. So you just need to actually recognize, excuse me, you need to recognize this as just one half Vmax. I was, I was thinking a little bit into Michaelis Menten because it's a little bit different than normal enzymes. Uh, Cause I don't think this is a Michaelis Menten enzyme because there's other enzymes that obey different laws. So never mind, just know this as one half Vmax. Um, that's always the easier way to remember it anyway. So we have to take a look at what these curves are. First of all, it tells us over here. So, well, I guess these are color coded so I can switch my pointers. Curve C is the substrate concentration curve for fructose 6-phosphate in the absence of an allosteric effector molecule. So it's saying when there are no activators and no inhibitors, we have this green curve going right here. So the green curve is when the enzyme has nothing bothering it and nothing helping it. It's acting completely on its own. So we can see that, you know, it has, you know, basically like when nothing is present, the velocity is zero, and then it has a one half V max right here. But notice this axis over here, the x-axis is fructose 6-phosphate. So this is the concentration of fructose 6-phosphate. This is going to determine how fast uh, the velocity that PFK1 is going to function at. So now that you know the axes of the graph and they have the base curve, let's take a look at why some curves are moved to the left and less S-shaped and why some curves are very general before they start spiking up and shifted over to the right. So, oh yeah, K0.5, that was the term. Cause like, I wanna be careful with like KD, KM, it's K0.5, um, but it's just half V max. It's very easy to see that though. So uh, let's talk about curves A. Well, first, before we talk, before you read this sentence, um, take a look at curve A. This is basically the efficiency of the enzyme is spiking much quicker. It is becoming efficient and very fast acting much quicker. And B is also not as much as A, but it is still spiking quicker because C is the base curve, but nothing is going on. So that must mean 
If this is spiking quicker and the, en the, uh, the enzyme efficiency is going up faster, that must mean that A and B must be activators. So if we go back over here, what did we say were the activators of PFK1? Well, we said it was ADP slash AMP, so the low energy molecules, and fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. So now let's read what this slide tells us these curves over here are for A and B. Um, awesome, red and blue, so I'll make a purple. Oh, there is a purple over here, so I can't make a mix, darn it. Um, so I'll just pick one of the two, I'll pick red. Okay, so curves A and B illustrate the effect of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate and AMP, respectively. That's perfect, it lines up with exactly what we talked about. Uh, moving over to the left, making the enzyme spike in efficiency quicker. That must mean it's an activator. Activator for PFK1, it's saying right here, fructose 2,6-bisphosphate and AMP. Go back to our little uh, thing that I made. AMP is right here, and then fructose 2,6-bisphosphate is right here. So we got it right. Awesome. Uh, it, this is over here. This is a, a graphical representation of what those two molecules do to PFK1. So now let's talk about uh, curves D and E. So now look, the uh, I'll switch to purple because one of these is purple. Um, the efficiency is spike. The v, the velocity, the efficiency. Basically, you can kind of use those interchangeably if it helps you. The efficiency is taking a long time before it finally gets going, and even more so in E. So before we talk about D, let's actually talk about E, because I mean, I've already reviewed what goes on here. So curve E, the one that is the most lousy PFK1, you know, the, the state where PFK1 is the most lousy of an enzyme. It's taking forever to get its job done. Curve E shows the effect of ATP in citrate. In, uh, it says in increasing the apparent K0.5, um, but it's just saying that AT, curve E is when ATP or citrate are present, basically. So ATP and citrate, um, we have to think, what is that going to do to PFK1? Well, if we go back over here, um, that is exactly what's over here and the, uh, the inhibitory aspects of PFK1 right here, the, inhibit the inhibitory parts are right here, ATP and citrate. Uh, it's basically saying your energy, your body is in a high energy state, so it doesn't want to do glycolysis because it has tons of energy already. Same thing with citrate. It's one of those things that exists down here in the TCA cycle that goes on down here. So look right here. We say they're inhibitory, and this over here is the graphical representation of these curves. So ATP and citrate is going to sh shove this curve over to the right, which means that uh, it's going to take longer for PFK1 to do its job. And sometimes these are so strong that like basically never does its job at all because these are such strong inhibitors. So, but now I, I skipped to E because, I mean, I already like prepared this lecture, basically. <laughs> it's almost a lecture at this point. It's very long, but once again, you can speed this up if you want. Curve D, as in dog. We need more dogs in the world. But anyway, so curve D represents the ability of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. Remember, this is the best friend enzyme. Fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. Curve D represents the ability of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate to overcome the inhibition by ATP. Remember, we just said that ATP and citrate, uh, they are going to inactivate. It's going to make this a horrible enzyme with the black curve. Now, curve D says that, well, fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, which is the best friend of fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, which therefore is going to help PFK1, the enzyme, be active, when the best friend molecule is around, it's going to save it from being out all the way out here, being the horrible curve of this, having uh, uh, phosphofructokinase 1 be such a horrible enzyme. It's going to pull it back in the direction of salvation, which is over here to the left. Um, getting poetic here, but it's going to pull it out from the depths of being a horrible enzyme, and it's going to make it a little bit better. It's going to make it closer to being normal or better or awesome. 
So the best friend molecule, that's what best friends do. I hope you guys have a best friend or some type of friend that's in this class because help each other study. Do whatever you want. Um, fructose 2, 6, bisphosphate, the best friend molecule is going to make it so that your PFK1 has a slightly better day. And then, you know, once you get rid of ATP, uh, technically it doesn't help with citrate, but ATP is a little bit stronger of an inhibitor, as we can see. But, you know, uh, once your body is in a not fed state, so you don't have ATP, you have AMP and ADP, that's going to uh, bring it all the way over here to have a really good functioning, super fast, super efficient PFK1. So... With that, holy crap, that was a lot, guys. If you are still here with me, like, oh my gosh, you guys are awesome students. Um, once again, speed the hell up out of this video if you really need to. Maybe it doesn't need to be sped up. Maybe I'm talking at a good pace this time. I don't know. It will never, ever, ever offend me if you speed up this video. Um, I'm just glad that I could finally get this done. Um, making, let me guys tell you, making this paper took about three hours to make it all nice and color-coded, to make you know, the light balancing correct to make, you know, some things bold and some things not. Also, I was writing all of this in pen. And if you mess up in pen, as you can see with the whiteout, like you're doomed basically. And uh, you have to be very careful. Um, I think that uh, my handwriting is acceptable. Um, I mean, I know it's acceptable. Um, I have decent handwriting for a guy and this was after writing for a very long time that made my hand hurt. And it's not my cursive. My cursive is my most pretty handwriting, but um, you know, I can do this as well. Um, you know, I'm good at both, I guess. But anyway, so um, I'm just kind of just having some fun with you guys now, just talking about some off-topic stuff. But um, yeah. Anyway, guys, this is really hard, all of this. But if you can get through this, like you can do anything in this course. I think this and purine permian biosynthesis are the two hardest things in this course because regulation, excuse my language, but regulation is a bitch. So, um, you know, but you're going to have to learn it. Um, you learn regulation in lecture 24 of glycolysis and gluconeogenesis. Um, but now in lecture 25, let me, we're not going to go into lecture 25 stuff, trust me. But if you can learn the regulation in lecture 24 with glycolysis and gluconeogenesis, you're going to be much in a much, much better place to learn about the regulation of all the other stuff you need to know about, such as uh, fatty acids, pentose phosphate pathways. Um, those are much less regulation, so probably do not expect a video on those because, you know, there's only so many videos I can make. But, um, you know, let me just throw it up here a little bit more. Oh, great. Progr this is the first time the program is live, the whole video. Um, in a way, that's a plus, and of course it's at the end. But um, I can just pull this up one more time real quick because it just show you that if you can do the regulation we talked about, then you can do the regulation of, uh, for example, things that uh, regulate glycogen synthesis and degradation. Um, you know, there's things that are going to, uh, to be phosphorylated to make it active and inactive. Notice, once again, it is specific molecules that cause regulation to happen. So I don't know if you can see my, I don't have my pointer out right now, but um, it's, yeah, so you can probably see this then. It's specific molecules that cause regulation to happen. So with that, we're going to end this video. It is hour 23 minutes and 47 seconds. So um, you guys have had enough, but once again, I hope you guys study hard because, you know, as you saw with exam two, it got a lot harder than exam one because exam one was just all the primary building blocks for you guys to succeed in the harder material at the end. So have a great rest of the day and study hard. You guys are awesome.